Hello, I'm Dave Buchanan. I'm a son of George Douglas Buchanan and Joan Kathleen Buchanan. Uh, he took all his training at that point in England, the rest of it, met a lot of his very good wartime friends, quite a few of whom were Americans who joined the Canadian forces before America was involved in the Second World War. After at the landing themselves, D-Day, he was on a LCI and they ran in the beach at uh, bernier sur -Mer. And my dad's stories all his life, he had flashbacks to what he saw uh, of men getting shot right in front of him and on the beach and the bodies and everything. Uh, as he always said, there was so much going on you could hardly take it all in at once. But his memories of uh, the Juno landings have stayed in his head up to, well, he died two years ago and he was 93. And even as he got older and sicker, he still remembered what he saw there. So for <laughs> Possibly, he would have been in his 20s when he joined up, born in 1918. That stuck with him for the rest of his life. Going, we knew something was coming. And then, of course, a day or so before, the, he called us up and told us what they expected. They expected 90% uh, casualties. On the thing. Is that what they told yeah, us? Yeah, that's what they told us. Just overall through pretty soon you could see just the outline it was the coast of France and of course there was uh, several fires going and you couldn't tell too much because it was kind of a haze you know and a lot of smoke and anyway the the first ones went in on these uh, suicide craft or were LCA LCA landing craft infantry and they were, they carry about 40 or 45 men, and they, two of a crew, they had the coxswain and a stoker that run the two V8. And they would make about, loaded about seven, eight maybe, we'll say seven. They were uh, just a death trap. And of course, a whole lot of them went in there. There was, they said 200, now we were told 270. And uh, about 250, one got hit a mine out piece, and then the rest went in. And as soon as those ramps went down, they were in a machine gun fire, you know. And there was uh, about 40 or so uh, out of that 250 that got in close, that made it in. Some of them were wounded. I would say, put in 25 minutes, and we got the order. And of course, we were on that craft that would make about, I would say, they said about 20, a little over 21 knots. And that's about 23 miles an hour. And that's moving. And they're full out, you know. And of course, as soon as at beaching stations, my job was in at the front on the uh, starboard ramp, you see. And then there was another guy on the other side on the port ramp. But as soon as we hit the beach and go in, the ramps go down as down ramps. And two of our men, one on each side, go ashore with a grass line. And those grass lines are made, they're made of a very strong stuff, but it floats. And that's to, when the troops start to come, some of the water fairly high, I could tip them up because they carry a lot of their arms up high. So they have to have something to keep themselves right at feet down, you see. And of course, when we got in, there was some of them that were in the water and up to there. But it's, there was waves going in and quite a bit of wind and, and broken cloud, but pretty heavy and it was going in and still the tide seemed to be coming in. And uh, what we, we were, as soon as they were all in, we, you can't stay in where we were for long. Once the ramps are down, you've got to come out because even though the exhaust takes out, there's fumes in there. So we got up and we were right up on the club forecastle. And we would be about 11 level with the top of the uh, seawall. And the seawall was cemented quite a bit, and then there was grass and, uh, and sawed all the way along on top of it. And we got up, and 
when we got in, there was our guys were streaming the shore to beat the band, and you couldn't. There was so much going on, and then there was they were firing mortars over, and uh, all of a sudden there was a bunch of the fellows in front that were going down. And you know the shooting, it was coming from this pillbox up about oh, 50 yards to the right. And I can still see that guy up, one of our fellows, up against the seawall, running over those bodies. Of the, the first one was in there, the bodies were all washed up against the seawall, and they were just laying in piles. And he, run, he was running over them. And you know, you're trying to run over a bunch of uh, fallen bodies, and kind of keep your balance, and he run down and went to that, and I don't know what he threw in. I imagine it was something more explosive. Somebody said it might have been uh, those Mangalore uh, torpedoes, but anyway, he threw it in through these slots they were shooting out in this way, and it rocked that whole doggone thing. The whole thing, I think, was going to go over. No more shooting out of that. And of course, you don't have time to know how many of these guys were uh, mortally wounded or what. There's so much going on, you can't watch it all. When it takes about, oh, 40 minutes to unload all those men, 400 men. And our 10 craft unloaded 4,000, there was 10 of us, for... Uh, 4,000 men right there. When we were ready to uh, take off, the skipper, of course, it's up ramps, and uh, mine come up and then the other one. By the time I got mine up, I was heading back towards the uh, up the wheelhouse and the extension of the, where the wheelhouse comes back where the engine room was. You see, the skipper got excited, and as usually as the thing to do, once you get that craft moving, you cut your main engines and let the winch take up and pull you off till you get right out. But he overrun the thing, just lost his cool, and of course the props cut it off, cut off this big cable about that, and of course we lost. And what we run now out there, I don't know, but it was the water was coming in. And Bud Chance and I went down in where it was, and we were actually standing in the bloody stuff, and it was coming up. And the and the Jimmy stuck his head in, and we were yelling at him, "Blankets, blankets!" You see, the troops had their blankets, and they weren't long. We got blankets, and we got a couple of the two. Of the fellows were hand, handling the engines. We got a couple of bars, and we're trying to cram. Uh, these blankets in this hole, but you get a jagged thing like that. We could slow it down, but we couldn't stop it. What? And about a quarter of a mile uh, to the east, just down, right opposite the town, right in, and we come in among the darndest bunch of mines you ever saw, and we never hit a one. It was just luck. We, and of course, we run smack up on the sand and then sh shut everything down. And of course, in spite of all the noise that was going way out, you know, there was so much noise. Everything on our craft was still. And the skipper come down, and he broke out the, the rum keg, and uh, we spliced the main brace. <laughs> Do you know what that is? That's two shots around <laughs> every. And uh, after a bit, I went out and went down where they had it. Uh, it was safe to go. And I come back and I was for a while and decided I was going down these steps just a little to the to the east of me. And anyway, I went down these uh, steps and the seawall there was very high and they weren't very wide steps going down towards the east. And I got right to the right to the bottom of her four ivory seas. Here this Canadian soldier, he was laying his feet were there, and he was right up against the seawall. And he had been killed, I guess. He'd made it to the seawall. And he was the only one there. There was none, nobody else had, they'd been killed, I guess, coming in, you see. And he didn't have uh, his helmet, and he didn't have uh, his rifle, and he had, uh, one pant leg was torn, I don't know, it was, 
and you couldn't tell. Of course, he'd been in, in the water, and he'd probably got right up there, and the water was still coming in, you see, and died right there. Um, but anyway, he was uh, a Canadian. You could tell by the shoulder patch. He could have been Winnipeg Rifles. And, uh, but, you know, you see what a fight he had to get in there, you know. And uh, anyway, you get thinking, you could almost imagine that you could uh, see his parents back home, like his uh, mother and dad. They'd be, they'd be listening to the radio. They'll know what's going on. And then maybe a couple more, like a sister and a kid brother or something like that. You always, it all goes through your mind. And then you imagine, you know, you could almost hear them talking, you know. And like if you hear, like this kid asking his dad, Dad, you think Jimmy will be there? Dad? Oh, I'll bet he's there. And of course Jimmy was there and, and all the other guys laying on the beach, they were all there. Well, you, this this fellow, you know, you couldn't get your eyes off of them. Yeah, thinking, my God, you know. And uh, but anyway, I thought, you know, God, I'd like to just lift that guy up and hold him for a bit. But you you couldn't do that because all you could do was look down at it and and uh, cry about it. When I come back, I started come uh, come back uh, to the seawall. There was Bud standing up by the, our fallen buddy there, and I know he was having the same problems as I did. Uh, you know, um, uh, he was the tears uh, streaming uh, down his face, and then I got thinking. You know, there's something crazy about it. Here we are, fighting men trained to kill, and you know, fighting men trained. Uh, to, to kill them, they don't shed tears. Or do they? You've always remembered that, eh? But anyway, I went back up on the, on the craft and I didn't want to. There were several fellows down the bottom uh, getting something to eat. And, uh, but I just stood around up there and watched stuff going on. But you know, it's a funny thing. All those guys joking bunch, there was no joking. Any conversation was very serious stuff. No laughing, no loud talk. I went out on uh, the sand about maybe, uh, 30, 40 yards, and talk about activity on that beach, you couldn't imagine. Them. And of course there, the, now, and the funny part by this time, even before that, all the clouds were gone, the winds was gone. And if you'd order up, ordered a, a special beautiful day, you couldn't got anything better. It was just as calm and warm, but out on the, on the beach, talk about activity, and you see there.